Right. So what did we do? Um, where did we leave off? Where did we leave off? We we got we got sort of into um, we got a little bit into Ramani geometry. So there's a Ramanian structure on H, and in fact, even a tangent bundle. Uh, well, this allowed us to define uh, a unit tangent bundle. A tangent bundle we can define without the Ramanian structure, but to measure distances to be able to say unit, uh, we need we needed this. Uh, we talked about flows, like the geodesic flow. The geodesic flow. Yeah. The right action. Right, right. That, that this is conjugate to the the right the right action of the group, and we wanted to get towards. Okay, so let's um, let me not spend too much time on this, but a Ramanian structure always induces a Laplace Beltrami operator. Laplace. Laplace operator, which Beltrami showed how to do in the general setting of uh, Riemann uh, geometry, it's manifolds. So in this case, for H, I'll omit the calculation, but for, for H, the, the Laplacian is negative Y squared times the Euclidean Laplacian. Okay, so this is a fact. What would you see the or, differential geometry? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So it's like root G, there's a there's a little formula for, uh, of course, which which one derives in Ramanian geometry for what the what the Laplacian should be. And what do we want this Laplacian to satisfy? Well, we want it to be. So here's the uh, a, a key feature. Maybe I'll make this. Am I going to do it? Let me make this an exercise. Um, yeah, let's make this an exercise. Exercise. If I define. Uh, so for G, for G in G, G is PSL2R. Uh, let LG be the left operator, uh, be the uh, left uh, operator, i.e. Uh, F of, so LG, F of um, Z. If f is a function on the upper half plane, then Lg replaces f by f of g. In other words, just composition with g, but it's a it's a left operator because it's because it's really uh, acting in the left. Um, for g and g, let Lg be the left operator. Then uh, the Laplacian commutes with the left operator. In other words, if you first stick in a G and then differentiate, you get the same thing as if you differentiate and then apply it to G of Z instead of at Z. That doesn't characterize the last right? That's the that I would um, Well, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's the salient. So what's really going on, how much do I want to go into this now? There's a better way to understand the Laplacian, which is that it is a specialization of the Casimir operator. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but how much do I want to go? We can we can take a. In fact, let me make this an exercise. Where's the connection between Laplacian and Casimir, and why that's the Laplacian is something I've been wondering about for a while. Okay. So that, that is something I'm interested. In. All right. So let me try to. Let, let's try to do a little crash course on this. So, so well, if the goal here is to give you a crash course on all, lots of different modern tools in analytic number theory, then certainly uh, understanding this from the Lie al algebraic uh, side is something that I think is useful. So, so exercise one is is direct computation. Okay, direct computation, direct tedious and annoying computation, direct tedious, uh, uninspired, inspired computation. And what you're saying is this Casimir stuff has like the sort of essence or... Exactly. Well, so let's, so let's see it. Uh, proof two, proof two of what, of what this is, uh, is to recognize that uh, there's, there are certain differential operators, which, so it's not just the Laplacian that has this, it's, the entire universal enveloping algebra, which will have this. Uh, 
universal enveloping algebra. That's a, a technical term for it. Just means okay. So so proof two, proof two is Lie theory, Lie Lie algebra, the action of uh, uh, of of what uh, what a Lie algebra is. Okay, so let's talk about what the Lie algebra. Is. So the Lie algebra for SL two uh, R is the set of all matrices. Let's call them X two by two matrices, real entries. So that when you take the matrix exponential of X, in other words, one plus X plus X squared over two factorial and so on, just the power series expansion, this does converge. You have to see that it, that's true uh, at the level of uh, matrices as well. So that this matrix is in G. So the definition is general, uh, but we're gonna do so calculations and especially like you're thinking a log. Like exactly. Exactly. And people actually uh, think of it that way. Yeah, exactly. So what this is, the way to understand the action of, okay, so what, so first of all, what is it? Uh, maybe an exercise, a side exercise. Should I do it for you? Claim. Claim. claim fine. Claim, <laughs> claim and the proof will be an exercise. Claim is that uh, X, A, B, C, D is in G, if and only if the trace of X is zero. So this is traceless matrices, okay? And this, this comes from a, a, a simple fact that the determinant, uh, so here's a, here's a real exercise. Right, this is a exercise. Form. Exactly, the, the determinant of, of X. Uh, so is everything in G to be SL or uh, uh, PSL? Um, it's SL. SL then over C will be different than just trace zero, right? So, uh, well, there's the there's SL two C, and then there's the complexification of a Lie algebra. So SL two C is a Lie, the six dimensional Lie real Lie algebra, which can be complexified. So there's there's like two different eyes floating around when okay. when you do that here. So let's let's not go to the complexification just yet. Yeah. yeah. So, so the exercise is that the, if you exponentiate a matrix and then take its determinant, it's the same as taking the exponential of the trace. Okay, and you can see this on the level of diagonal matrices. And if it's diagonalizable, then this is true. And if it's not, then uh, you can write it as a, as a lambda block and so on. So I've, I've, I've sketched the exercise. I but then- a limit and you can conjugate and- uh... Right, and so so that immediately implies this because uh, the trace x, the e to the zero is one, and the only condition we're checking here is whether the determinant is one, which is why I don't want to do p s l because then it's not matrices but uh, classes and so on. So let's let's just stick to s l. So this is the the Lie algebra. Um, once you have a Lie algebra, what it really does is it gives you a way of taking directional derivatives. So it gives you vector fields. On your manifold. So, so what is um, this elements? Okay, Dan, and what is our manifold in this case? We're taking it the SL. Well, um, it's not really so. It's so if you have any function, elements x in G can be turned into uh, differential operators, differential operators on functions on G. I guess it has to be, you know, differentiable or something. So, corresponding so if you have a function Lie algebra to operators on functions from the group to so, so here's that. Let me just write down the definition and you'll see what's going on. So if you want to know what X does to F, what's the differ differential operator? So what will it do at G? So it's going to be a new function that's going to take G. What does it do? You take f of g, you multiply by e to the some parameter t times x. So that has that's a one parameter thing. So you're changing this function now. It's a function of t basically. You differentiate with respect to t. Okay, f goes to c. F goes to c. So this is now. Sense. So if you like, if this is now a big function of t for any fixed g, for any fixed g, okay. 
This is a big function of t. And then you evaluate this at t equals zero. So that gets rid of the, so you gave yourself a parameter. It's like saying, if I wiggle in the direction of x, right? What does it mean? What is this, uh, this is roughly one plus tx up to higher order things. So if I, if I change g, if I take f of g and I change g by a little bit in the direction of x, how does that, what does that do to the function? Then why would we do it with the exponential function then? Ah, because it's because uh, f needs to take values in g, the exponential uh, of tx. Would, then like, the exponential would. Exactly, would exactly. i plus tx is not in g. Right. i plus tx you is not in g. Think about it that way. Right, locally, it's, a, it's approximately this. But, it's, but to get it at, f only takes values in g, g is a group. How do I get into g from the Lie algebra? I, I exponentiate. Wait, where does G live again? Um, G, G is in the group. Oh, okay, so it's the, oh wait. So I have a new function. G. This is a new function from G to C. All right, what's the derivative? Derivative takes functions, let's go back to R. Derivative takes functions from R to R and makes new functions from R to R. But, but I guess what I'm confused about is what does this have to do with the Lie algebra? So X is an element of the Lie algebra. The fact that it's in the in the oh, Lie yeah, algebra, yeah, yes. Yeah, so true. so that's the direction in which we want to differentiate f. Oh, okay. So that gives you okay. So your g your g frac is sort of like your set of directions. Exactly. Exactly. It's the vector field. Also define Lie algebra as the tangent space at the origin. Well, that's where that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, We're sort this of is the connection. This is the connection. Right, and, and I'm being ahistorical because that's how it was initially defined until it was whittled down to uh, these much more basic uh, ideas. That's exactly right. And do these, okay, so you're in the sense of finding a derivative on... Let's do an example. Yeah. Let's do an example. Um, we, uh, let's take, say, well, so in the case of, of SL2, in the case of SL2R, what is a basis? Let's take a basis, uh, a basis for this vector space. Now, this is a vector space. You can add things that have trace zero and uh, scale things that have trace zero and still have trace zero. So this is a vector space, and that's a general uh, fact. Yeah, that's what's going to do like NAK. Exactly, let's take X1 to be that, which has trace zero, x2 to be that, which has trace zero, and x3 to be that. Which is why we give them the names n, a, and k. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's the vector space of, it's, this sits in R4, and it's a- No, no, sorry? sorry, no minus one on x3. I mean, not that it really matters, but no minus one on X three. You have uh, zero, zero minus one or one, zero. Um, right. So I could have taken at an alternate X three is just to take that, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, I've taken this one for a particular reason. Oh, OK. OK, fair enough. Um, certainly you can, uh, so, so how do you, if you have something, how do you decompose it into this basis? You first read off this component. Uh, of course you can read off that component and then you adjust this component, uh, given the fact that I put a minus one there. If I, okay. if I, yeah, if yeah. I didn't put a minus one there, that's a, just as well, uh, a nice basis. Yeah, um, my bad. I thought it was just a typo, but it, it was not a typo. It was a, it okay. was on purpose, but, uh, but there's good reason to put that minus one there. The other thing I was going to say is maybe it's helpful to compare it, like the situation to Rn, right? Like in Rn, you define derivatives in a direction, and the direction is defined by something in Rn, but you're just yes. not seeing like the tangent space versus the manifold, right? Exactly, because that's they great. Like, uh, yeah, so in Rn, the tangent space is Rn, and so when you take a directional derivative, you say go right. in the direction. Yeah, go right there. Whereas, whereas here, uh, we're sort of, we're taking directions in G, but G is itself, S, G is AD minus BC equals one. 
So G is a submanifold of uh, R four cut out by this by this equation. Yeah, and like, so, how would you define direction in G? And I right. guess this sort of gives you a way to define direction. This exactly gives you a way to define direction in G. Like, if you were able to see this as a thing in R four, would it like? coincide with the regular derivative? Well, what is a regular derivative? I want to differentiate while staying in the manifold. Well, I want to know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to differentiate the function this way. I don't have uh, values out there. I want to differentiate in the tangent space to, oh boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to G. So this is, this is what does it. Okay, so here you're taking your G to be SL2R. Yes. Which means that your big G is then going to be what, exponentials of these. Uh, big G is SL2. Big G is SL2R. Big G is big SL2R. <laughs> this oh, is little. This is, is little, these are frac. Okay. Yeah, these are meant to be frac SLs. Oh, I see. I see. That's the big G you picked up. Yeah. Okay. These all have trace zero. That makes not a the lot term. of sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, <laughs> but. The definition, again, is that if I exponentiate somebody from here, I get somebody there. So how do I do it? So what is, so here are some more exercises, although they're pretty obvious. Uh, if I exponentiate x1, what do I get? And, and you can scale it by a- uh, One t0, or no, one e to the t0, whatever. Um, Later terms are gonna die out, I can't remember. Exactly, x1 squared, it's nil potent. Oh, x1 yeah, yeah. squared is zero. One so this just is one plus tx in this case which is one T zero one. Identity is one is zero zero. Oh, you're literally writing. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is because X one squared is zero. And of course all higher powers as well. Okay. So that's, so that's again, where, where the term null potent, where, where N comes from. This is unipotent. Why is it called N? It's called because it's exponential of, of this nil potent. How about x2? Exponential of t times x2. Well, it's already diagonal. Whoa. Uh oh. Oh, e to the t0 is zero, e to the t0 is zero. Exactly. e to the t0 is zero, e to the minus t. Right? It's just, uh, right, right. Diagonal it's, it's diagonal already. already. Okay, and so Lewis, this is why I chose x3 instead of x3 prime. If, if exactly, if you exponentiate x3 prime, it's the same as exponentiating x1, you get the lower unipotent. And just to show a different uh, exponentiation, uh, if you exponentiate t times x3 instead of x3 prime, so now this, this, is, this has order four. So when you square it, it goes uh, to a diagonal. When you cube it, it goes back to this, but with a minus sign. And when you square it, it goes back to a diagonal again with a minus sign. So if you continue that pattern, you exactly pick up the exponentials, uh, the, the Taylor series of sines and cosines. Right. Okay, so this becomes cosine t, sine t, minus sine t, cosine t. And hopefully I haven't missed some minus signs here. Maybe this, maybe this is cosine of minus, maybe the minus sign goes the other way or something. I don't know. I just randomly chose minus one there as opposed to the other place. Okay. Now we're supposed to be able to do stuff with this. Now we're supposed to be able to do stuff with this. So that means we can differentiate. If you have a function on G, you can differentiate in the direction of K or in the direction of A or in the direction of N or N bar. Okay. So it's, it's exactly by the formula. Um, if you have a function, so let's, let's take uh, X1. Um, let's take X three. That'll be the easiest thing to do. Okay. So what does X three do as a differential operator to a function? Well, how do I want to write my G? Maybe I'll write my G as NAK. Okay. So if I have, if I write G as NAK. Okay. So I've taken this differential operator. What does this differential operator do in these coordinates? All right, so that's f of g, which is n a k, and then e to the t. Remember the remember the definition. Right. Uh, e to the t x three. E to the t x three. We already computed. That's a k t. 
And then I'll differentiate with respect to t, and then I'll set t equal to zero. In this case, k theta adds to t. Exactly. So differentiating in this direction is exactly the same thing as, so I claim that this is just dd theta, the partial in the theta direction of f in the coordinates and x, a, y, k theta. Then like what, what does this mean? Does this mean component wise you're gonna take derivatives on k? So or? another way of thinking about this is you have a map from uh, r cross r cross, I guess, r mod to pi into g. So you're viewing these as like linear trans, uh, linear fractional transformations and then that's how? No, this has nothing to do with, uh, this is just a function on the group. So matrices. So just a matrix, exactly. So what really I have is a function on x comma y comma theta. So because f is what's doing that, right? F is, f is an arbitrary function. Converting things into real data on which you can take a derivative? Exactly, a differential operator, you know, uh, so this as a differential operator in these coordinates is just the derivative in the third component. Okay. Um, so how do you go from, right? The from here to here. Yeah, from okay. The so when we're differentiating with respect to T, it's di it, this is just, uh, if you think about uh, what we've done to the function, we had X, Y theta. We replaced, so we had f of, let me abuse notation and write still f as, as if it's a function of three real variables. Okay. okay, so so we had a function of three real variables by which I mean, take x and make it nx and take y and make it ay and take theta and take make it k theta, multiply those two together, you get an element of g, evaluate f on that element of g and you get a real number. Okay, so I'm composing, I'm implicitly composing f to a real number, a complex number, whatever. So is this function differentiable in any sense? They are R, R over two pi t, t? If f is differentiable, ah, is this function differentiable? Maybe, maybe that's the definition of what f is being differentiable would be. Uh, well, you can define being differentiable just in, in terms of these derivatives existing and so on. I'm saying that I'm from z to c. Yes. When would I call that differentiable? So you would call it differentiable if why would you call it differentiable or, or what's the, what would be the definition? We want to say something about F to make this process compatible, right? We want to say something about that. So I'm not, uh, I haven't said anything. F can be arbitrary, if F is too bad, can I still do that thing? No. no. For, for the same reason that you can't differentiate arbitrary functions. What's an example of an So, so what's, mm -hmm. what's the assumption on F? I guess that's my question. The differential operator doesn't care about F. I just want to know what the differential operator is. And for that, I take a smooth, compactly supported test function on which to evaluate the differential operator. Right now, what we're doing is we're computing, we're figuring out what X3 does as a differential operator. So X3 is an element of the Lie algebra. And I'm trying to convince you that elements of the Lie algebra correspond to derivatives, directional derivatives of directional derivatives. So defining when I wrote down uh, the Laplacian, this uh, minus y squared, two derivatives and x plus two derivatives. I didn't say what, what space of functions this should be acting on or what, what class of functions, you know, okay, I want it to be twice differentiable in x, twice differentiable in y. Maybe I want it to be continuous, maybe whatever. I didn't say anything about it. I just wrote down the operator, right? And then you have to figure out what class or you have to specify what class you want it to apply to. So here, I'm not specifying what class of Fs I want to apply it to. I just want to work out what this operator is in coordinates. So in NAK coordinates, which really means a map from R cross R cross R mod two pi into G, what this operator does, what this operator X3 does to F is the same as if you just differentiate it in the third component, partial derivative in the third component of F. I guess my question is, right, that Sure, if these were real variables, this makes a lot of sense, but these aren't real variables, right? Well, what do you mean? Like the, an X, A, Y, K, theta? The, the X and Y and theta are real. They're just real numbers. I have a triplet of real numbers, X, Y, theta. 
Uh, oh, okay, I see what you wrote down there. And then they and they become an element of G. And they take you to C. So you're sort of viewing this as, oh, okay, so you're viewing the derivative as like a real thing going from, okay, now I understand what you guys just Well, that's, uh, we've put a coordinate system on G, right? We sort of realize G as a, before I had this, you know, picture of G as some kind of, you know, manifold in R4. But now I've given a coordinate, a coordinateized G. Is this like independent of your choice of coordinates? No, no, it's very dependent. If I choose different coordinates, I'll get a different differential operator. Even though X3 is the same directional derivative, how you choose to coordinateize that changes the meaning of, of the derivative, of changes the uh, formula in terms of the coordinate system. Okay, so this is always like, when you're doing this, you always have to keep in mind which coordinates you pick. Well, if you want to express X3 in coordinates, then you have to keep in mind which coordinates you picked. But X3 is just a differential operator that's agnostic to your choice of coordinate system. Somehow this operator is supposed to have properties in, like, intrinsic to it that should depend yeah, so on- Well, look at the definition. Think of it like a matrix. A matrix doesn't have a particular form until you pick a basis. So a linear operator doesn't, yeah. Yeah, so the-, the the differential operator depends on the coordinates in as much as a matrix depends on the basis you pick. Right, yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure that is, yeah, the case. That, that is the case. Because look, when we defined it, we didn't say what coordinate system to take on G. Right. We just said, whatever your function is, if it takes values in G, then this is what the new function is when you, which we call the derivative in the direction of X. Right. So, so I guess what I'm asking is if instead of the decomposing G in N A K, so you decompose it in N A A. Yep. Right. Then you should still yep. obtain the same derivative. You can do any coordinate system and you'll get, it'll be the same differential operator, but in that new coordinate system, it'll have, there'll be some Jacobian. Right. There'll be some, you know, weird factors here and it might not be only directional. It might not be only in the theta direction. It might be in the theta plus a, a y direction or something of, based on your choice of the coordinate system. Right. Exactly. Okay, just, okay, so that's and so, uh, right, how did we get here? This is not what I meant to talk about. Uh, the Casimir operator. operator, right. The of these, uh, right. So, well, if you can differentiate once, then you can differentiate many times. And that's what the universal developing algebra is. So the universal developing algebra, U of G. Again, saying that F is nice enough, right? Like, like yes. Smooth, compact, we support it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that could be your test function, but the operators are agnostic to the function. The operators are just operators. Right. right. As long as there exist the, functions, they will do things. They'll have right. different um, behaviors on different classes of functions. But the we're going to define operators sort of abstractly okay. and not uh, not restrict them to one class or another. So the universal, this is called the universal enveloping algebra. I don't actually know why it's called this. <laughs> it's very uh, exotic. But it's very simple. It's just take all derivatives, all orders of all derivatives, all orders of all derivatives. You just put these into a set. Well. I mean, like yeah. take the theta direction, y direction, x direction. You can only combination. you can't take random combinations and expect them to be uh, if they're not uh, if they're not uh, Lie derivatives, then they won't have the nice invariance properties. The invariance property being commuting with the uh, the G action. So what are you going to choose to be inside? Anything that's a, you take any element of the algebra, you differentiate F with respect to that element. That's a differential operator. You want to do X3. So this is, this is where things get a little crazy. When you write X3 squared, do you mean, do you mean take the matrix X3 and square it sometimes? Or do you mean take the differential operator X3 and apply it twice? Right. Okay. So, sorry? Really algebra, the second one. I mean, more generally, the second one makes sense, right? It's like if you're okay, but, an infinite dimensional vector space. Right. I mean, so, so you shouldn't understand this as multiplication in G, in the Lie algebra G. You should understand this as sort of the tensor. If you take uh, the tensor product, you know, K-fold tensor product of G. 
with itself, and and then take the union over all k. Over so this says green, I guess. Um, over you know, uh, uh, so so what I mean like is vector, like a, the vector space kind of thing. Exactly. Just like right in that sense, right? Yeah. Like in all these things, they have the structure. So that means take whatever, so you have a sequence of, of elements, x1, xk, in G. This is no longer a basis. I was writing, uh, let's, let's call them y1 through yk, not to confuse them with the basis x1 to x3. So you have a bunch of elements of the Lie algebra. Okay. That, gives a that gives a differential operator. And that differential operator is you act by y1, then you act by y2, and so on, then you act by yk. So the universal developing algebra is, this, is the collection of all such differential operators. Of any order. And you're saying they act in this derivative sense that you define above. Right. So you take, so what you're saying is that you take the set. So I mean, this this is the stuff that people spend a whole semester developing. I'm giving you a very uh, uh, very brief and very yeah. No, I just wanted to have an idea of what sort of things are in there yeah. at all. Right? So what's in there is anything that's a derivative of combinations this. Combinations of elements of those, and then you take. Right. You're saying it's this. Is that by one because I know for like like a matrix the algebra. I know you get the universal developing algebra by taking a algebra structure instead of taking commutators. Now you just know how to take products, but it's not like free products. It's it's that it knows that it still has that relation that x y minus y x is still a commutator. It still knows things about. Right. Well, does this make sense that this would? I haven't understood how it's defined. Now this makes a little more sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that tensor thing? Is that coming from Montgomery Birkhoff Witt theorem, or is that, or is that more definition of the universal <laughs> algebra? Um, I can't remember which way it goes. Right. There's a variety of ways of presenting this. I've only seen P W alluded to. I haven't actually seen that. Yeah. Um, let me let me try to steer the discussion back to <laughs> no, no, what I fine. actually wanted to talk about today. That, that's fine. But this is, I mean, you know, it's good to have these uh, the, these side excursions, this the scenic route, as I as I keep promising. The point is, there's a center of the universal of algebra, something that commutes with all differential operators. Uh, let me just uh, more words for for okay, so you. The center you're defining as right, just what it sounds like. Yep. The is a different that commute with everything else. The differential there. operators that commute with all other differential operators. Okay. okay? So uh, D's that commute with all others. Okay. And um, and the Casimir operators more in, in higher rank, they'll be uh, more than more than one. We're in rank one. So there's there's a it turns out the center is generated by the Casimir operator. It's a one-dimensional so, space. Right. The center net here is one-dimensional, and it's generated by something called the Casimir operator, which we can write down in terms of uh, a basis and a dual basis so uh, with respect the to the killing form. operator is going to be one of these that we were talking It'll It'll be a second-order operator. OK, so this is, a, in this case, a, a second-order operator. That DXX, DYY over Y squared. Well, uh, so again, it operates on functions. So this is on, on functions, let's say smooth functions on G. And when you restrict the operator to act on K fixed functions. Okay, so um, if we restrict C, the Casimir operator, to the subspace C infinity of G mod K. K being the K being SO2. Oh. Uh, C infinity of G, which are invariant under K, right? Invariant under K. Okay, so if we restrict this to this subspace, um, then in N X A Y K theta coordinates, if you compute what C is. C is the Laplacian. It's easy. Once you have the theory, I'll yeah. lay down. And it's really fun, actually. It's a shame that that's that, that, that we're doing <laughs> this. Uh, what do you mean by we're in one right now? Oh, G, our group, G, SL2R, is a is a rank one group. So you take this abelian uh, 
you know, maximal abelian subgroup, and it's just generated by e to the t, e to the minus t. This diagonal, one, you know, one dimensional diagonal uh, matrices. Um, all right. And right, since it's part of the center, it means it trivially sort of has to commute. Right, it commutes with other differential operators, other differential operators coming from the universal value boundary. Why does it commute? So now I can ask you, why does, again, why does delta commute, commute with LG? Right. Well, look at what LG does. So again, LG, the reason I called it LG is because it puts G on the left. So this puts a G on the left. What does the differential operator do? It puts X T X on the right. Mm. So they just trivially commute because they're happening on opposite sides of the group. In fact, it's, it's not the Laplacian that, that does this, but any differential operator, any, any uh, operator in the universal envelope commutes with a left uh, group action. Okay, so um, let me let me write. Uh, so LG of f, if if I think of it as acting not on z but on uh, h, where h is in g, and I'm thinking of h as uh, f as a function that's that doesn't care about k on the right, that's invariant under k on the right. Then what we said is you take g and you just multiply g on the left. But any uh, any uh, differential operator and, and, and anything generated by differential operators in the universal of Lie algebra, any uh, differential operator in the Lie algebra. Uh, oh, I think I see what you mean now. Yeah. Because, like, it doesn't matter which order you do them, one, they're going to go on. If they were on the same side, then maybe they would be in opposite orders, right? If, if they were on the same on. side, then they could interfere with each other. But they're just completely, you can multiply on the left and multiply on the right, or you can multiply on the right and then multiply on the left. Okay. Either order you do it, it's going to have the same the same effect to, to what you're doing. So this is on the right, and this is on the left, and that's why they commute. Okay. That was a, a long excursion and a little crash course, and we won't see this. Uh, well, maybe we'll... Now, now that we've done it, maybe I'll add some more uh, about the usefulness of this. But anyway, but I digress. Um, what the hell was I doing? Right, I was, I was introducing this Laplacian to uh, introduce the Eisenstein series. So let's get to Eisenstein oh, yeah, series. Eisenstein series. So the point is, uh, we know it's easy to find, easy to find an eigenfunction of the Laplacian on h f of x plus i y equals, it turns out that y to the s is a very nice eigenfunction. Why is that? So proof. Well, uh, any derivatives in x of f, there's no x. Yeah. The deriv one derivative in y is s times y to the s minus one. Two derivatives in y is s times s minus one, y to the s minus two. And if you remember what the Laplacian is, negative y squared times the Euclidean Laplacian. So this, this part is zero. And I recover, exactly, because I multiply by y squared, I recover, uh, so delta uh, f is equal to s times one minus s, if I take this minus sign inside s minus one, uh, f. So it's an eigenfunction with eigenvalue s times one minus s. Okay. Um, uh, here's a question. Is, um, is y over x plus one squared plus y squared to the s also an eigenfunction? Also eigenfunction of delta. Oh gosh, this would be a giant mess. To do. So you have to differentiate with respect to x. You have to differentiate with respect to x twice. 
we get this massive, you know, god awful chain rule. Differentiate with respect to y twice. Maybe it is. I don't know. Let's see. Does Mathematica? Oh, this is. I should have tried this out before. Um, so what did I say? Y over uh, x plus one squared plus y squared, all that to the sth power. And if I differentiate this with respect to x twice, and I differentiate it with respect to y twice, and I multiply by negative y squared, oh god, what an awful mess. And I get s times 1 minus s times the original thing back. Well, there's a minus sign. I'm pulling that minus sign in. S times s minus 1, y over x plus 1 squared plus y squared to the n. How did I know that was going to be an eigenfunction of the whole function? How did mathematics know to simplify like that? Uh, it's got a good simplify function, I guess. <laughs> so Mathematica says yes after a god awful computation. Mathematica says yes, but it had to be an eigenfunction. So f is y to the s, let's call this g, g of z. f is an eigenfunction, and g of z is f of uh, 2, 1, 1, 1, z. Because f is, you take the imaginary part and you, uh, of z, and you raise it to the s power. And this is the imaginary part. I've just composed F with an element of the uh, group. It doesn't, uh, there's no discrete group yet. I mean, this is, an, this is an integer matrix, but that's not what's making this possible. So the uh, imaginary part of 2, 1, 1, 1, Z raised to the Fth power. But the imaginary part of GZ is the imaginary part of Z divided by CZ plus D, CZ uh, plus D, norm squared, all raised to the fth power. But C is one and D is one. And what is CZ plus D norm squared? It's exactly what I wrote. It's X plus one squared plus Y squared. So that's why this god awful function is an eigenfunction of the, the Laplacian, because this thing is in G. And the Laplacian commutes with the G action. Okay. So this is the beauty of having invariance and uh, having things set up in a, in a nice way is that uh, uh, these calculations that are, you know, you just do a calculation and Mathematica says, yes, it's an eigenfunction. But why? There has to be a reason for it. What does this make concrete and number D? Like I imagine probably people look at this through examples first and then realize something was going on or did people just straight go with Lie algebra and then was like, oh yeah, of course, pass me your operator. Yeah, that's a great question. At which point was this all fully understood in this, in this way? Uh, it, it was definitely stumbled into in a variety of directions. So this is not what we're about to, this not a homomorphic Eisenstein series. I mean, there's the holomorphic Eisenstein series, which uh, one could say goes back in some form to Eisenstein. Uh, and, and we'll touch modular form, so we'll, we'll talk about that when we do it. We're going straight to the non-holomorphic one, uh, which in some sense is more important. Um, was it introduced by Moss or by Selberg or by people before? Certainly Selberg understood the importance of the theory of Eisenstein series in the spectral decomposition of uh, functions on um, you know, on the modular surface and so on. Um, and then Gelfan was instrumental in getting representation theory and tools from the algebra uh, into this theory with Pitesky Shapiro and uh, Graev and uh, Fomin and so on. And understanding also what we talked about last time was the geodesic flow uh, Gelfan and Fomin understood 
as being something that's just geometric in the same way all these differential operators as being all these geometric things as being algebraic mm. and in the same way all of these differential and geometric objects Gilfan says no no you should be thinking about them as algebra so algebra rules that's uh, uh Gilfan's sort of central thesis uh, I don't disagree with it I still like the geometry <laughs> but there's a lot there's a lot of mileage that you can get from recognizing geometric things as uh through an algebraic operation. So here, the geometric thing is, well, we've, we've taken these derivatives of this random function that I wrote down, and it turned out that it was an eigenfunction of this differential operator. The algebra thing is, yeah, it's just composition with the group action, which commutes with, uh, with the Laplacian. OK. Um, obviously, you can't just write down a random function here. Right. And expect it to be an eigenfunction of, of the whole function. So you can write a random g element. And, uh... Exactly. You can write a random g element, and that will be an, an eigenfunction. Okay. So um, uh, let's, go, let's go. All the you just take y of s and take all the. So it turns out no. It turns out that they, these aren't all of them. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the amazing thing. That's the Selberg trace formula. So we're gonna we're gonna um, I probably won't do this the tra the Selberg trace formula. We did a baby trace formula just so you had uh, uh, Henrik's doing the trace formula, right? Or at least the spectral theory, or both. Uh, I'm going to do the trace formula. I think. Okay, great. So. Um, but also this class is right after this one, so it's those are the good ones that speak uh, this class. Mm -hmm. Right. I see. Okay. Um, okay. So. Having found an eigenfunction, this y to the s is one eigenfunction, and realizing that if you translate this by any element of g, you still get an eigenfunction, we can construct, this allows us, allows us to construct uh, gamma invariant, invariant eigenfunctions of delta. In the in the dumbest possible way. So this is called the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. Non-holomorphic. It's really funny that like when Bump talks about this, it's not like this this product at all. Are you doing it through this sort of Laplace operator point of view? They just do it like boom, you define it and then you sort of move on. Uh yeah, there's a variety, you know, uh probably someone who learned it like this for the first time and then goes reads bumps and, and says, Oh, this is much more. Now I understand it. It's, it's what you're familiar with. You're familiar with it already, so now you can catch much more nuanced things when you're seeing it, you know, a second or third time. So I remember when I was studying for my oral call, like, uh, George and other people had pointed out, right, like there's these Laplace operator that has these nice properties with it. And then like the book hadn't mentioned it at all. So I just thought it was a- There's only so much one can say. And yeah, I mean, we're doing a crash course. There's a million things I'm not mentioning or I, I'm just alluding to so many in passing. So, uh, so what do you do? So we'll call this E, Z, S. So you take your imaginary part. Uh, if I put any G here, I'll get an eigenfunction, but I'll take uh, functions gamma. So this is the thing that I know is an eigenfunction for, for, any, for any G and G, and in particular for any uh, gamma and gamma. Gamma is SL2Z, SL2Z, PSL2Z, whatever. SL2Z. And I sum over all gamma and gamma. I leave a little room here. Exactly. We have to be much, much more careful than we're being. Um, so this function obviously satisfies uh, E of gamma ZS is equal to E of ZS for all gamma and gamma, that it's gamma invariant since I averaged over gamma. Okay, unfortunately, as defined, uh, this function is infinite. Yeah, it's only depends on the bottom row. Of the exactly, the imaginary part is in, invariant under translations that only change the real part. So I have to mod out by the group of translations that only change the real part, which is gamma infinity. Gamma infinity is uh, exactly the thing that fixes infinity is is the group of translations, and if we mod out by those, then we get this. Okay, so. Um, now, does this, so now we've at least fixed the fact that it's infinite. Does this actually converge anywhere? Does this converge? 
mean in s? Yeah, as a yeah, for or in really in which range of s does it converge? Converge absolutely. Um, well, again, if we write out what this quotient is, so gamma mod gamma infinity, we've done this calculation, I think, is the set of all bottom rows. So two matrices agree up to uh, translation if and only if their bottom rows agree. We must have done this. Uh, I think we've done this. We've done it. Good. Uh, and what are the bottom rows? There are any any pair of numbers that are co-prime. So any pair of CD that are uh, co-prime. So we can sum over CD co-prime. And imaginary part of gamma z is y to the s over norm cz plus d to the 2s. And the point is, this is a sum over a rank 2 lattice. So you can compare this sum to the integral uh, of, you know, basically c squared plus d squared. For any fixed, for any fixed value of z, this is like a uh, quadratic a homogeneous quadratic in CD. And so the number of integer points is like uh, Z squared, N squared, number of integer points in the lattice of size N. You guys know what I'm saying? Or should I say that more, more slowly? Like I, I've seen like the explicit proofs, right? In which you don't pass to integer groups. And then you just like, I mean, you do so that you count lattice points and then like you know. Yeah, at some point you have to go to the fact that if you sum over C and D, let's say both at least one, of one over c squared plus d squared to the s, which is basically what we're looking at and here. It's proving it's a convergent series in a more range. Right. This converges, converges, if and only if the real part of s, which of course is all that matters when we're taking absolute values, absolutely converges. If the real part of s is bigger than one. Okay. So for the same reason, this is the this is the domain of convergence of this initial definition of the Eisenstein series. OK. Um, what? At least, at least for the last statement, you can tend to do a double, you tend to do an integral and then do the spherical. Exactly. Yeah, Exercise. Uh, prove this by uh, polar coordinate integral in R2 by polar integral in R2 using R dr d theta. So that R is what's going to make, uh, anyway, that, that's what will make this real part of S greater than greater than one. OK. So far, so good. Having strayed very far from our original goal of Dirichlet's uh, theorem on primes and progressions, let's come a little a little bit back in that direction. What the hell does this have to do? What does this does this have to do with Dirichlet? Was there something else I wanted to say about this? Uh, mm, yes, but we'll come. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let, let me do one more thing. And then uh, see, there's this uh, sum equals one. And it would be nice to be able to free these variables. So we're going to come, come back to Dirichlet in just a second. Yeah, we're going to come back to Dirichlet in just a second. Uh, uh, can we free, can we free uh, the condition that C and D is co-prime? So we can by Mobius inversion. Have we talked about Mobius inversion yet? I don't think so. Okay. So let's talk about Mobius inversion. I mean, the sense of like, you know, in a very general sense. In the sense of Dirichlet, yeah, as a Dirichlet convolution. Right. So, so we know, okay, so how do we, I don't like this condition. I want to sum over C and D freely. Um, how do we know? Uh, so, so we know that the zeta function, sum over n to the s, is also a product over primes, one minus p to the s inverse. So one over the zeta function, we can write by this product, product over the primes, one minus one over p to the s, no inverse. And if I multiply all this out, what numbers do I get? 
So if I multiply all this out into some series, n to the s, and collect the coefficients into a function, which we call Mobius. Yeah, well, so we get products of primes against one another, never higher powers of, of primes, just the primes themselves, and with pluses or minus signs, depending on whether there's an even number or odd number of primes. So that's, that's it. Uh, the function is zero if there's a square that divides n. And if n is square free, uh, if n is a product p1 through pk, including k equals zero, then it's minus one to the k. Okay, so that's this Mobius function. And now the very simple observation, so there are two observations. Uh, on the level of Dirichlet series, we can define Dirichlet convolutions. So uh, zeta of S times one over zeta of S is obviously the function one, which we will record as a sum over N as a Dirichlet series of the indicator function of N being one. On the other hand, it's a product of two Dirichlet series. There's a sum over, let's call it K, zeta is one over K to the S, and a sum over, let's call it L, of Mobius of L over L to the S. It's this yeah, N the equals one. one. Yeah. Unit function times Mobius to be indicator. Well, that's exactly what this what this proves. So if we open this up and we collect terms, now we have a sum over n, one over n to the s, and then where do I get this? Where do I get a factor of n? Whenever k times l is equal to n, so it's a sum over all k times l equal to n. It's a divisor sum of one times Mobius of L. Okay, so this, so in general, more generally, more generally, on the space of uh, Dirichlet series, if F, if F is a Dirichlet series A n over n to the s, and G is a Dirichlet series B n over n to the s, we can define, we can define Fine, whoops, fine. Um, Dirichlet convolution which is simply uh, that, um, well, I just want to take f of s times g of s and that will have a series Which is the co which is the uh, convolution, Dirichlet convolution, the nth Dirichlet uh, convolution of of this, which is what, where a star b of n, how could these combine? I could have written these as a k's and b l's, and it's just a sum over uh, again k times l equals n, or alternatively d dividing n. And then uh, B of D, or A of D, it doesn't matter by symmetry, A of D, B of N over D. And in general, you can sort of, um, when you define this Dirichlet convolution, you can sort of detach yourself of questions of convergence. Right. right? Because here, at first, this, you have series, but in general, you can still do this. Right. right? Why is it convolution? Why is it? Why is it called convolution? Why is convolution a good name for this operation on series? You've mentioned this at some point. On the digital convolution, you have one variable and then uh, the difference. Here, yes. The multiplicative, so it's taking a quotient. So it's the D in one term, the one over D in the other. Yes. And it's this weird sum where you divide by the ends and it has the symmetry. Yeah, uh, I would say the reason is the ANs are the Fourier coefficients of F. They're not Fourier coefficients, they're Dirichlet coefficients. And the BNs are the Dirichlet coefficients. And so the reason I, I like this as a convolution is because the standard convolution has the property that it's Fourier transform, 
is the product of the Fourier transforms. And the Fourier transform, in other words, when you put this into a series, you get the product of what you would get on the individual series. So this is why it's a convolution, which you can just see very, very easily on the level of Dirichlet, formal Dirichlet series, not worrying about convergence, not worrying about any other kinds of manipulations. Okay, so what we've learned, what we've learned is that if you take the divisor sum d dividing n of Mobius of d, which is exactly this, you get the same coefficient here. This is uh, one if n is one and zero otherwise. Okay, so you can remove, all of this was to remove this, uh, this square free condition by replacing it with a sum over Mobius. Um, let me put back where we were. Right. We were uh, here. The sum of Mobius is the indicator function. Because the sum of Mobius is the indicator function. Exactly. So, so let me, uh, so back to, back to E of ZS, which is a sum over C and D with the property that they're, uh, GCD is one. Nick, something you don't like. The point is that that's the same thing as this function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm just comparing the two Dirichlet series. Yeah, I, I see it. Cool. Now, if you were trying to do this formally, uh, why is it true that two functions, if, if the functions agree in some, in some nice space as complex analytic functions, why must their Dirichlet coefficients agree? Because it's like a power series expansion. Yeah, but actually we know that if you take, so, so this is a function, complex analytic function. Mm -hmm. So is this in some half plane. They agree as complex analytic functions. Why must their Dirichlet coefficients agree? Why am I claiming then that this coefficient is equal to this coefficient? And you can prove it so inductively, right? You mean you could prove this formula? But you just prove, combinatorially. You can prove that you have under certain conditions virtually inverses to your functions, right? And that, like... Yeah, if you recall, so this is just uh, to recall back to something else. Uh, if we take one over two pi i, an integral over some vertical line of f of s, uh, x to the s ds, this Perron type argument exactly will pick off uh, a, a sum of the coefficients up to x. And so if the functions are the same, then these sums are the same for all x. Well, that means as you change X, you're seeing the same coefficients go by. Anyway, that's just a little side, side I mean, comment. There must be something easier, right? Because you have a sum a n over n s is equal to the well, sum. So, yeah, Sorry, interrupt. Go ahead, Lewis. Uh, yeah, so I mean, one, another way to see it, I think, is because the, the functions n to the s have different rates as s goes to infinity, right? Sure. That's some time. Like, but once you have two uh, functions and you yeah. don't really know all that much about the coefficients. Yeah. How do you guarantee? So like I would, I think if, so just look at the first terms, you can get those because S as S goes to infinity, the everything else goes to zero, right? So then the first yeah. terms have to agree. So then you could like uh, subtract those off and uh -huh. then by like two to the s or multiply sure. by the s or something and then repeat. Yeah. I like that. That's another argument. Is that what you were, Leonidas? Yeah, I'm That's... saying if you minus them, then they have to represent the zero without a n minus b and zero. Right. So the real question is if a, if a Dirichlet series is exactly zero Can you and converges, all the a n's must be zero. Yeah, I think yeah, it's way out of this. Maybe right. It well, so Lewis's argument is first send s to infinity. That means the first coefficient has to be zero because that's the only one that doesn't go to zero. Then, okay, you know the, the zero, you know the first coefficient is zero. Now multiply by two to the S and send S 
to infinity. Everything, you get two thirds to the S and two fourths to the S and so on. Those are all numbers less than one as S goes to infinity. Oh, I see, this is what you guys are asking. Yeah, so you could do it coefficient by coefficient. Yeah. Like that, okay, great. All right, uh, very quickly, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, right, so we're here and I'm gonna catch the condition that C and D have no prime factor in common by, as long as I'm summing over C's and D's that aren't both zero, uh, I have my Y to the S over CZ plus D to the two S. And then here I can sum over any L that divides both C and D, Mobius of L. And so it's this sum that will catch the, uh, the coprimality. It's going to be zero unless uh, C and D are coprime. And the coprime is going to give you. If they are coprime, it'll give me one. Right, right, because then you're just getting mu one. I'm getting mu, well, just by this formula, by this formula. If you sum the divisors of a number, <laughs> and here I'm, I am summing the divisors of a number, this, these are the divisors, this is L dividing the GCD of C and D. Right, exactly. Then if they weren't co-prime, then you yeah. have to uh, fix something else. Exactly. Okay, and this thing we can call, this thing we can give a name, so it's not separated, right? It's it's this this depends on C and D. If you have a sum like that, though, then isn't that always going to be one? Um, it'll be one as long as C and D are co-prime. Wait, but say say for example that C and D oh, share the factor of two. Yeah, then that's zero. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, yeah, as a sum, as a sum, yes. The sum is the uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we can open this in reverse orders. In the interest of time, let me just call this inner thing without this term uh, E star. This is a standard terminology. Let E star of ZS be the sum. And let me change notation to M and N, M and N, not both zero, of Y to the S over MZ plus N to the 2S. And then you can observe that if, they, if M and N have a common factor, so if M and N have a common factor, let's say uh, the GCD of M and N is L, pull it out, pull it out and, you, and, uh, and then M over L is C and N over L is D, then you can write this as the original E times what you've pulled out. And what you've pulled out is a uh, sum over the possible uh, common factors of L to the 2S, also known as zeta of 2S. Okay, so again, we're seeing that if you take E and you multiply it by zeta, you get E star. And uh, a similar computation says that this is E star times one over zeta of 2S. Two, of two and again, yep. zeta, right, is there a Schleiss series instead of like the main sequence or whatever, the, the unit, right? And then exactly. Like, the all ones is, is inverse, right? exactly the, uh, exactly and so in this so. and in the space of Dirichlet series this this Dirichlet series is the identity element right it, it can if you can involve this if you can involve anybody with this you get back to where you were and these functions form a group right like under the, so condition. exactly Dirichlet series I mean just sequences under Dirichlet convolution form a Form a group structure. And you need what, like for the first element not to be zero or something? Yeah. Because you're going to need a, something. You mean, uh, uh, like so. A of zero can't be. Uh, right. Or zero. these things only take values on the positive integers. Right. That's, right, right, that's right. another way of, uh, of thinking about it. Okay. Um, let's, uh, why, why do we care about this function or this function? Where, how will this get us back to, uh, let's, let's get it all the way back to the class number formula, which we were trying okay. to prove. So back towards, at least, maybe not two, but towards uh, the class number formula. Class number formula. So let's say 
we have a quadratic form Q, which has coefficients A, B, C, right? This is AX squared plus BXY plus CY squared. It has a root. Let's say the discriminant D is negative. D is B squared minus four AC is negative, bless you. And it has a root alpha Q, bless you. Negative B plus root uh, D is negative. So I'll write this as root D I over 2A. What is, let's compute, E star of alpha Q? This is a point in the upper half plane. Let's compute it at alpha Q. Basically, instead of like these group orbits or whatever. Uh huh. Of so, this of this root, yeah. Some people call these Heiner points. So, if I sum over uh, all m and n that are not zero, uh, y to the s, y is um, y is root d over two a to the s. You see that? I'm trying to show both this and this at the same time. And then M, okay, alpha Q plus N squared to the S. Okay, so let's work out what M alpha Q plus N norm squared is. Okay, this is M. Um, alpha Q is negative B plus root D I over to A plus N times its complex conjugate, M times negative B minus root DI over 2A plus N. Okay, so I get the real part squared. What's the real part? It's a little hard to see. I have a M, a negative B M over 2A plus N, which is common in both. It's a difference of squares. So I have a negative m b over 2a plus n oh. squared and i have the complex part squared so it's a difference of squares with an i squared so that minus turns into a plus and i have a m d over 2a m root d over 2a squared okay hopefully i'm getting this right Hopefully you guys are checking me. Um, great. Okay, let's open this up. I have a negative. So I want to take out this 2a squared out of everything. So I have a negative mb plus 2an squared. So I have a negative, uh, so a negative squared is positive, m squared b squared minus. 2a n m b times 2, 4a n m b plus uh, 2a n squared, 4a squared n squared. That's this bit. Plus, I pulled out the 2a squared, and then there's an m root d. So that's an m squared. So that's an m squared times the absolute value of d. Remember, d is negative. So the absolute value of D is negative D. So this is not B squared minus four AC, but four AC minus B squared. Um, There's gonna be some cancellation. M squared, B squared, yeah. gone. Um, what else do I have here? So what am I left with here? I'm left with a, a factor of, well, let, let, I'll deal with the factors. Uh, after I have a four a squared n squared, as, a four a uh, as we'll see in a second, uh, minus four a n m b. Um, plus m squared oh, four. It's a quadratic form. It's a quadratic form. <laughs> it's a quadratic form. So all of this is being multiplied by one over four a squared, the fours are gone. One of the a's is common. And I see that this is one over a times a 
n squared minus b n m plus c m squared. That's exactly what q is oh. of n negative m. Whoa. Just because there was a sign. Yeah, how would somebody even do this? Like, how would you find out? Oh, yeah, I just put the root into the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. Well, there is a natural way. So you'll see in a second what's about to happen. So given that that's what this, this m alpha plus n squared is just a quadratic form with a factor of 1 over a. So let's put that all back into here. You'll see in a second how you would have maybe come up with something like this, reverse engineered it. Okay. okay? So I have e star of alpha q s is equal to a sum over m and n, not both zero, a sum over m and n, not both zero. I had this y to the s, root d over 2a to the s, root d over 2a to the s, and then this thing in the denominator to the s. So that's this thing in the denominator, which means I have an a over q of uh, n minus m all to, the s. all to the s. Now, I don't need absolute values because q is positive definite. And I'm not allowing 0, 0. So actually, this is always positive, And I'm assuming a is positive, as usual. OK. So the a's here and here cancel. This is a factor that pulls all the way out. So this is uh, d to the s over 2 times some factor of uh, 2 to the s. And then what do I get? A sum over all the values taken by q, but raised to the s power in the denominator. This thing. S greater than 1. Exactly. All of this converges just fine if the real part of s is greater than one. This thing has a name. I'm sure Lewis knows. Yeah, it's the Epstein zeta function. It's the Epstein zeta function, zeta function. If you want to study a quadratic form, a very standard thing to do is, okay, what are the values that it takes? Stick them into a series. Then you'll understand what values it takes. Okay, so you could go backwards by starting with an Epstein zeta function, oh, I see. pulling out this factor of a, rec recognizing that this can be written as, uh, if you make a change of variables, it's just m alpha plus plus n norm squared. That's all this. That's all this is. Is that if you pull out this leading term of a, that q can be realized as can be diagonalized to just the sum of squares. Uh, and then the last observation, and then we'll stop. So if you have two forms, Q and Q prime, they're equivalent, properly equivalent. Yeah, the sum's going to be the same, right? Uh, properly, in other words, equivalent over S of 2Z. Then alpha Q is just gamma times alpha Q prime for some gamma, for some gamma and gamma. Mm -hmm. And the Eisenstein series takes the same values. So E of alpha Q S is equal to E of but alpha like, Q prime. We you like not need even that because like if you're, if you have the same discriminant already, yep. and you already know that a change of variables takes you from one to the other, then those sums are clearly going to be the same already. You don't need like, well, that's right. I guess your change of variables is the gamma, really. The so change of variables is the gamma, it's exactly. It's the same thing. Exactly. Okay. Um, um, uh, fine. So, so, okay. Last, last hint of what's to come, what's to come, what's to come is if we take a sum over all classes of Q of discriminant D and we evaluate them at these different points, Um, I claim that this will be a certain series. Uh, yeah, okay. Like this, yeah, this is gonna be a, a zeta function of a quadratic uh, extension. And, uh, and if we can get analytic continuation of the Eisenstein series, uh, claim 
that this Eisenstein series has meromorphic continuation. Yeah, uh, there's a variety of ways of doing it. Uh, maybe I'll give, I'll try to give Selberg's proof, I think, actually, uh, just, to, just to give a variety. Uh, if this has more meromorphic continuation and pole at S equals one, in fact, the pole is equal to uh, one over the covolume of, of gamma. Then what will this, if we take the residue, if we take the residue at S equals one, on one side, we'll get the L function of, of chi at one. On the other side, we'll get exactly the class number. Because it's the same residue summed over however many classes there were here. Here we'll get the class number. Okay, this is what we're going to do next time. This is we're going to make our way towards next time. But we'll need this meromorphic continuation of the Eisenstein series to make sense of it. I'll, I'll try to say a little bit about what this is, and uh, this is what's to, this is a preview. It's a preview of where things are going. All right. Questions, comments, complaints. We don't need the minus, right? Go up a little bit. The yeah, we could at this point drop the minus yeah, once yeah, it's a sum over yeah, all. Yeah, sort of like, like, exactly. Yeah, just to be correct. Uh, <laughs> but you're right. At this point, we can forget about the minus. <laughs>